explanatory tool is a key part of Sensi that gives you information about your game that goes above and beyond that presented in the game's interface. The explanatory tool allows you to view graphical representations of your game in the form of line graphs, discover insights into some of the rules underlying the game, and create multiple parallel timelines or game branches to explore alternative approaches. The explanatory tool can be accessed at any time during or after a game through the Analyze menu in the upper left hand corner. There are three types of graphs representing aspects of your game that can be generated using the explanatory tool. Object graphs, action graphs, and composite graphs. Let's look at object graphs first. An object graph depicts how an object's attribute values changed over time. An object graph can be generated by first choosing an object in the Object Graph drop-down list. Since we've been focusing on the Requirements document, let's choose that one. The requirements document attributes then show up here in this list. Choose one or more of that object's attributes to graph. and then click the Generate Object Graph button. In all object graphs, time is represented by the horizontal axis, and attribute value is represented by the vertical axis. The key below the graph explains which data points correspond to which attributes. So in this graph, the red line represents number of known errors, Blue represents number of unknown errors, and so on. Any data point in the graph can be moused over to reveal that point's exact x and y values. So for instance, here at about clock tick 100, we can see that there were about 33 unknown errors in the requirements document. Looking at the graph as a whole, we can see that the number of unknown errors and percent completeness represented by the blue and yellow lines, respectively, increased at a relatively constant rate throughout the time period. We can also see that the percent erroneousness of the requirements document started at zero, increased quite suddenly here, and then remained at a relatively constant level. And we can also see that the number of unknown errors started at zero and stayed at zero for a relatively long time period, and then started to increase here around clock tick 75. All graphs generated by the explanatory tool, meaning object, action, and composite graphs, can be customized in terms of appearance by right-clicking on the graph. They can be zoomed in or out on. Colors can be changed and labels can be turned on and off through the properties selection. And using the right-click menu, you can also print a graph, or save it as an image if you want to keep it for future reference. And these graphs are all updated in real time. So if we go back and step forward some clock ticks, you can see that the graph moves along here too. An action graph provides a trace of events, actions, or activities that occurred in the simulation. An action graph can be generated by choosing one or more actions to graph in the Action Graph list over here, and then clicking the Generate Action Graph button. We'll choose two actions that we performed in our example game, Create Requirements and Review Requirements. As in the object graphs, the x-axis indicates time progression in clock ticks. The y-axis in an action graph has no semantics, but only serves as a delineator for graphing actions. Each action is graphed on a separate grid line on the y-axis. The key below the x-axis indicates which data points correspond to which actions. The data points for an action begin at the time that action was triggered and end at the time that action was destroyed. For example, this review requirements action, represented by the blue line, began at around clock tick 75 and ended at around clock tick 275. Mousing over a data point will display the name of the action and a reminder that the data point can be clicked on for more information. 
when a data point in an action graph is clicked on. The details and effects of that action are displayed in another screen. There are two tabs in this screen, Action Info and Rule Info. As their names indicate, the Action Info tab contains information about the action, and the Rule Info tab contains information about the rules that are attached to that action. A rule defines what effect an action has on the rest of the simulation. For example, one rule attached to a Create Code action is that the size of the code increases every clock tick by an amount based on the employee's productivity and coding. Let's focus on the Action Info tab first. The Action Info tab is divided into three portions, one for each type of information provided about the action. The top portion contains a description of the action. In this case, for a Create Requirements action, it simply means that software engineers create a requirements document. The middle portion displays the participants that were involved in the action during the clock tick of the selected data point or the point that was clicked on to bring up the action information. In this case, we clicked on clock tick 187 as shown up here in the title bar. So we see here that these four employees were selected to work on creating requirements, Andre, Calvin, Anita, and Pedro, as well as the requirements document itself, the requirements capture tool that we chose to use, and some other objects that were linked behind the scenes. The bottom portion of the Action Info tab lists all triggers and destroyers for the action so that the player can see exactly what could have caused the action to either start, which are what action triggers do, or stop, which are what action destroyers do. A user can click on any one of these triggers or destroyers to bring up a description in this field to the right. For this action, we can see that there's only one possible trigger. The user choosing the Create Requirements document item from an employee's right-click menu when some certain conditions are met. We can also see that there are two possible destroyers for the action, or conditions that would cause the action to stop, in which, one in which the user chooses the Stop Creating Requirements document item from an employee's right-click menu, and one in which the Requirements document percent completeness equals 100. Now let's look at the Rule Info tab. As mentioned before, a rule defines what effect an action has on the rest of the simulation. An example being that one rule for a Create Code action is that the size of the code increases every clock tick by an amount based on the employee's productivity and coding. On the left-hand side of the Rule tab are listed all of the rules that are attached to the selected action. Trigger rules are those that occur when an action starts. Destroyer rules are those that occur when an action stops. Intermediate rules are those that occur once every clock tick during the duration of the action. We can see that a Create Requirements action has only one rule attached to it, an intermediate rule. When you click on a rule in one of the lists, a description of that rule appears over here in the description area. So we see that this rule does a number of things. It decrements an employee's energy and mood as they work. It updates their productivity level and rate at which they introduce errors according to their current energy and activities. It increases the size of the requirements document according to the employee's productivities, as well as the number of communication links in the action and the use of a requirements capture tool, which speeds the activity up. It causes the number of unknown errors in the requirements document to increase according to the employee's error rates, again as well as the number of communication links in the action, and the use of a requirements capture tool, which we see here, would cause their error introduction rate to go down. And then there are a few other parts of this rule that concern other artifacts. If the code, design, and or system test plan for this project are more complete than the requirements document, 
This causes the number of known errors in each of these artifacts to increase. In other words, this tells me that I should make sure that I follow the typical waterfall steps and make sure that all requirements are specified in the requirements document before they are designed, coded, and the tests for them are planned for, or else development will suffer. This is just one small example of the kinds of things you can learn from looking at these rules, things that would be more difficult to infer by simply playing the game. The information contained in these rules is possibly the most useful part of the explanatory tool, immensely valuable for helping you do well in the game. However, it is also a part that people tend to forget is there, so try to remember to look at these rules as much as possible. If you feel stuck at any point, it's a good idea to revisit the rules to try to see if there's anything you're missing, because again, there is a wealth of information contained in these rules that simply is not explicitly available in the game. In addition to viewing rules through clicking on an action graph, rules can also be viewed through the lower half of the explanatory tool main user interface by choosing an action in the Actions drop-down list. This will make the rules appear in the list down here. Like the Rule Info tab, any rule in the list can be clicked on to bring up its description in the window to the right. Another good tip regarding rules is to always look at the rule or rules attached to the game ending action. In the waterfall model, this is the Deliver Product action, which you would know if you played the game the whole way through. By looking at the rules attached to the game ending action, you can often see exactly how your score was calculated, which would of course directly help you learn how to improve your score. To better demonstrate the third and final type of graph that can be generated, we'll first go back to the game for a moment and complete one more development activity. So if you'll recall, the initial development of the requirements document is complete, indicated by its 100% completeness, and some developers are reviewing it. Let's have all of the employees join in on the reviewing so that they can get it done more quickly. Okay, so they've found 80 errors. Let's get those fixed by telling them to correct the requirements document now. And I'm just going to choose everyone to work on correcting it. And we'll use the requirements capture tool again. So you can see that the errors are disappearing as they correct it. Okay, so now they've taken care of all the errors indicated by zero number of known errors here. So let's go back to the explanatory tool and generate a composite graph. A composite graph shows both an object graph and an action graph lined up on the same time axis, so you can see how an object's attributes changed as a result of actions that occurred. To generate a composite graph, simply choose the object graph and action graph settings that you want then click the Generate Composite Graph button. So we'll just keep the settings from the previous object graph and action graph that we created, adding the action that we just performed, correct requirements, and generate a composite graph that shows both of them together. Now this may look complicated and it might not be obvious at first how a composite graph is useful. But let's take a closer look at one part of the graph to show how they actually can be quite useful. Look at this last upward slope in the number of unknown errors from approximately clock tick 300 to about clock tick 385 or so. Now it might be unclear why this slope is there, why the unknown errors would be increasing while the document is being corrected, indicated by this turquoise line here. Now correcting is supposed to get rid of errors, right? You would probably first notice this effect by seeing the hidden attributes revealed at the end of the game and observing that even though you did a thorough review of the requirements document and corrected all of the known errors, there were still undiscovered errors in the document at the end. 
Well, looking at this composite graph would provide you with the reasoning behind this. This final upward slope in unknown errors corresponds exactly to the correct requirements action, indicating that this action is probably the one that caused some more unknown errors to be introduced into the requirements document. Clicking on this action in the graph will then reveal why. If you look at the rule attached to this action, you can see that the employee's correcting requirements will introduce new errors into the document. So you can infer from this that it's just as important to have skilled personnel involved in requirements document correction as it is for requirements document creation and will be likely will be likely to be more careful in assigning people to this task in the next game. If you recall, I just assigned everyone to requirements document correction. But now that I know this, in the next game I would probably be more careful to assign only those that I know are skilled in requirements. One final note about the explanatory tool. Keep an eye out for secret actions. These are actions that were not visible during the game, but are visible in the explanatory tool graphs and rule descriptions. In the waterfall model, there are suggested phase duration actions for the various development phases. Suggested requirements, phase duration, design phase, implementation, and testing. If we graph one of these, let's say suggested requirements phase duration, along with all of our requirements activities, we can see how the time that we spent on requirements aligns with that that's suggested by the explanatory tool. So we can see that it aligns pretty well in this case. But if it shows that we're spending too much or too little time on requirements, we can adjust accordingly and thereby improve our score. Now this is just one example of how a secret action can help you, but there are even more helpful ones in other models. For example, in one model, there is a double productivity action that causes the whole team's productivity to double when certain conditions are being met or things are being done in an ideal way. And just what this ideal way is could be discovered by looking at that action's trigger.